like to start our session on healthcare simulation, need of the hour. Medicine and nursing has traditionally relied on a see-one-do-one approach of learning, which inexorably exposes patients to novice, inexperienced and hyper-skilled healthcare practitioners, which result in dangers and harms, adversely impacting patient safety and consequently clinical outcomes. Healthcare simulation is a pedagogy to replace or amplify real patient experiences with guided experiences, artificially contrived, that evokes or replicates substantial aspects of the real world in a fully interactive manner, thereby helping each healthcare professional to be patient ready for providing a high level of patient care. Debriefing session following the simulation activity helps in promotion of reflections of the participants and remains the heart and soul of simulation activity. This session focuses on need and role of simulation as an educational strategy for providing the opportunity for learning that is both immersive and experimental. To elaborate more on the advantages of healthcare simulations, I would like to invite Surgeon Commodore Dr. Manish Honwad and Mrs. Abra Pearl. Dr. Manish Honwad is the Senior Registrar at INHS Ashwini, Mumbai. Sir has specialized in anesthesiology and was a professor of anesthesiology at AFMC Pune. Dr. Manish also has numerous publications in indexed journals. Sir has served as a flight surgeon on aircraft carriers and commanded the INHS Sanjeevni at Kochi, Kerala. I request Dr. Thank you, Dr. Manish Honwad. Mrs. Abra Pearl serves as a consultant to the Indian Nursing Council, Government of India. Ma'am is a master trainer in skill standardization and simulation training and has an experience of over 15 years in nursing and midwifery education and public health. Ma'am has helped establish several national nodal centers for, for nursing and midwifery education in India. I request Ms. Sabra to grace the days. Thank you, ma'am. To initiate the proceedings, I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Manish Hanwar. A very good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, Pune is my home base. Uh, so uh, I must, at the foremost, thank the organizers of this conference for having invited me for this talk. And uh, we, I am also fortunate to have a co-chair. So if I miss out on something, I am sure she will cover it up. And uh, over the next probably one hour, we are going to speak on the uh, importance of simulation. And uh, why, uh, uh, you know, it's taking on in a big way. And I'm sure this is a mixed audience. So uh, I've added a lot of videos in the middle to uh, keep your interest. And uh, I can I have the uh, first slide, please. If uh, uh, I'm the senior registrar of INHS Ashwini in uh, Mumbai. We are a, a thousand bedded uh, tertiary care hospital. And we have all uh, sub-specialities and post-graduations, including uh, nuclear medicine, radiation oncology, hyperbaric medicine, uh, we have post-graduates uh, post in all uh, specialities. Uh, we have a College of Nursing and an Institute of Paramedical Sciences where we have a simulation center. Uh, I have also uh, been in touch with Symbiosis earlier uh, during my tenure at AFMC when we conducted combined workshops and we have uh, a lot of role in faculty development in simulation where uh, we have a sort of, sort of a national faculty where we take on BLS, ACLS, ATLS. So I'm quite aware and uh, also uh, I'm... Uh, it's a proud privilege for me to come back and meet my senior colleagues from AFMC who are here at SIHS. And uh, so before much ado, I'll uh, try to move on to why simulation is a need of the art. Uh, this is uh, the way I'll propose to complete my talk. It all began here, way back, when doctors used something called personal digital assistants. These were the first black and white devices which came on. And most of these were used by doctors way back in the US, where most of these were held. And most of the medical software was written on them. They were, it was a much better system called PALM. Unfortunately, PALM was killed, like how the PALSICAM was killed by the PVHS and other things. But then uh, way down, this was uh, most of the doctors have used this at some time or point in their lives. Even today, using a third party software, I'm able to use some of the simulation here. Like for example, ICU maths, ventilation. If I want to change the ventilation parameters in ICU, I can still calculate. And uh, it does not crash like Windows or it does not have any other issues. Unfortunately, it is no longer available. It is still available to a small niche of people who uh, like to use this. So actually, let me say that screen-based simulation started off with these palm tops, so-called. And most of the palm tops were used by the doctors. And uh, the precursor to simulation was aviation. Just like safety in medical branch and medical uh, sciences has, uh, you know, learned from aviation industry. 
there were a lot of aviation accidents way back in the 1960s and 70s and it was thanks to Boeing and so many other uh, flight simulators and their checklists where they brought down and made flying as safe as possible. Similarly, those principles of simulation were taken from the flight simulators and they made human patient simulators, various types of things and brought in these things so that we could introduce safety. Not only that, it was skill based learning and team building. How, how do we do it? I'll just show you what happens here. Uh, just watch this as So this is a moving platform, the MiG-29, which is actually Vikramaditya. I use the Russian version of it because for security reasons, I can't push the other one. Uh, but how, how is this possible for a pilot to be so, uh, to do it so uh, well and uh, error-free? Uh, is because he learns on a flight simulator. He has to do hours on a flight simulator, pass it and then come back. Now, uh, the same thing in medical simulation, uh, uh, the definition is of course there, but uh, no longer is the time when you can probably go and practice on a guinea pig who is a human. So therefore, you must go to the sim lab, practice all your things, gain some sort of an experience before you go on to the real patient. That is number one. Number two is errors. There are many ways in which uh, you can, uh, you know, master certain skills. I am an anesthesiologist, I work in the OT and ICU. There are many such skills which I have to impart to my students. With overgrowing curriculum, increased course curriculum and less time that we have, we need to do just-in-time training and ensure that when somebody passes out, he or she has gained basic minimum qualification criteria. The must-know has to be known. So how do we do that? We have to have simulation incorporated, not at the end, right throughout the medical curriculum. So that first stage, second stage, third stage, right from anatomy to when you become a surgeon or subspecialty surgeon or you're building your you know, team in cardiology lab, cath lab, you need to work with the entire team in a simulation center so that you don't make errors when you're actually doing that with the patient. Uh, there are three types of domains, cognitive, psychomotor and effective. There are a lot of educators over here also, I guess. So basically, uh, based on best standards of care, error management, patient safety, patient autonomy and resource allocation, all these are important when you're deciding on a simulation center. You may have a simulation center, but you need simulation educators. You need educators who are qualified, who are ratified to ensure that at all levels they teach, they change your personality. By the time from a medical student or a nursing student or a paramedic, you pass out. You have to ensure that this particular person has changed his personality to what we desire. So here uh, in simulation, we have immersion, we have immersive simulation. There's a lot of reflection and feedback. It is not just a skill learning process. Many of them think that, okay, you're learning laparoscopy, go on the simulator, work on it and come back. No, I'm building my team in the OT. I have to practice my emergency. So I have to build and have role play. We have to have, it's a multidisciplinary approach. We have doctors, we have nurses, we have paramedics, we have everybody and we give the scenario to them. We role play the thing in actual. It's possible with simulators to do the whole thing. And then every speciality everywhere, there is a role of simulation. Even forensic medicine, learning pharmacodynamics or pharmacokinetics of a drug can be done using simulation. Whether you want to portray anything in ICU, OT or this thing, there is a role for simulation in every place. The fidelity changes. You don't need high fidelity for everything. You could have part task trainers, you could have low, medium and high fidelity trainers to do your job. What are the advantages? No harm to patients. You can allow errors to occur. It's a realistic experience. Some of them, in fact, I'll show you some videos in which we'll do this. Uh, managing rare and uncommon situations. We have a rare disease, I can recreate it in real virtual 3D simulation. So suppose somebody has never seen this case, he need not see the case. He can actually do the simulation and he'll be fully confident in you know, dealing with it when it comes. There's no trial by chance. Procedural skill training. Uh, I do a lot of regional anesthesiology and when ultrasound came into the thing, it was first the radiologist who learned ultrasound. I learned a lot of ultrasound on simulation and it's really realistic. There's no problem. We have, we have hardly have, in fact, I stopped using the electrical stimulation for anesthesia. I was using ultrasound for the last 10-15 years and there's no problem at all. Because of anesthesia, I've learned all my videos and all on simulation and it's very good. Everywhere where I can give a block, I give a block. And even my students, they learn it so fast. Whether it's airway management, intubations and using the ambuscope, using, uh, you know, with the TB coming down and oncology, uh, passing double lumen tubes used to be a real art. And uh, people used to have, you know, you require a lot of time and cases when you do master passing double lumen tubes. But having real time simulators, I have a simulator in FMC where, you know, I teach students, everybody in my student by second year, they can pass a double lumen tube on the simulator very well. And you can grade them, you can see how good they are in it and you can do team building. So knowledge, skills and attitude will transform into efficient clinical care. 
uh, most uh, you know I, I i put this for regional anesthesia because that is where in my domain it catches but for the cardiologists for the nursing staff for the paramedical staff everywhere uh, remember one thing somebody will not do a cpr in an emergency something has there's a collapse if he has never done it before and if he has done it on a simulator it is more likely that he try it out at least so therefore i think as a citizen of this country all of you must know basic life support seattle is the world capital of cpr nobody will let you die there because every citizen over there knows cpr similarly we have reached a stage where we have started teaching cpr in schools so anybody above eight standard where they have enough weight they are about 35 kg so they can deliver effective cpr and i think dr savant is here and people from sihs dr parag we have uh, actually done a lot of workshops in pune zone and i think in maharashtra came one of the top when we are trying to train most of the students in medical colleges so every student comes out with at least bls and acls that is the doctors and nursing staff and paramedics do the bls at least and everybody should know atls those who are in this niche especially those of the clinical specialties because this is a must it is a must know then there is something called need to know and desirable so these you need to know and then you need the simulation lab you have to fall back on the sim lab for everything we opened up it as a game in fmc i you know the simulation lab was you know well load you not to log in log out we said no we'll push it down where the students come to play badminton so we got a whole floor it's like a mall and we put a one clinical tutor and two of them there we said come and practice intubation come and practice iv come and practice part tax trainers and come in the own time evenings because the new generation doesn't want to stick to your timings and we made it like a game come and make errors come and have fun we'll have a team and you you make the emergency you make the emergency where the tube is in the wrong place and give the relaxant and then suddenly the saturation falls so this is what simulation we do and others have to do it there is a precaution here yes as a simulation educator many of you are professors you will be educating them you must remember you are working with interdisciplinary teams and even today if you say i have to appear for an exam i will have something in the back of my mind so even sometimes the first time we did the simulation i have incidentally done my simulation education from dy patel and at that time when we were working we had senior professors they were mostly from anesthesia and pediatrics but we realized we have senior professors senior nursing staff who were literally matrons of hospitals we were doing the simulation together nobody wanted to make an error you are being recorded and you are going to be debriefed after that what did you do and it's played back to you it's played back to you and you sit around in a circle and uh, you know you are trying to say what went right how did it go what went right what went wrong what can you do better these are the four common questions which you ask and you try to go into it and actually you learn and this sort of immersive learning that you have with a team that leads to the actual outcomes and it is for the person who is designing the simulation to find out what outcome he wants sometimes it doesn't go the way he wants it but then the senior the educator he is able to process it in a way that the learning outcomes are achieved so uh, again the crm skills i'll just uh, i think madam is there so i'll not eat into the time uh, undergraduate training this is what you do you do just in time training and uh, you know uh, uh, adults have to unlearn habits sometimes they do things wrong but children don't have it so basically when they come at the undergraduate stage they absorb whatever you are telling them but the moment there is a dean or a professor and uh, he is already a thing you tell him no you are doing this wrong they don't want to like they don't like it very much sometimes we have had problems with protocols and we have had fights in the simulation centers we have had people crying when they come out of the simulation center because uh, so you have to maintain this so first of all we tell them uh, there'll be a first year resident and there'll be a professor who's 30 years of experience and you're working together so first of all ego goes out out of the window so we said we are like anesthetists we are wearing the scrub suit there's no rank there's no rate you're not anything you're coming here into this and you're allowed to make mistakes and you do as per protocols you learn your protocols early here we are not here to learn protocols we tell them you learn your aclas bls aclas your algorithms you should have them what we are doing in simulation is doing the final team building that is where high fidelity simulation counts uh, pg training yes implementation of certain things this is what we do that's flashed on the slide CME training. There's so many others. I think with shortage of time, I can't cover all. It's a mixed audience. So uh, maybe what do we do? We need to have a mix. We need to have a mix of part skill trainers, high fidelity simulated scenarios, virtual reality. Now we have 2D to 3D, and with uh, uh, many things coming up, augmented reality and all this. I'll just go in the next slide. I'll explain what I'm what I mean about this because everybody says machine learning, artificial reality. What is it actually? So I think like Windows for dummies. I'll tell you exactly for dummies what it is in just about five minutes. Uh, this is disaster management simulation plays a lot of role this is an actual air crash at sea which we simulated 
we had an air india imagine a passenger flight going to the sea so this was a tri service exercise which we did in which we actually had 150 of our naval divers into the sea i picked them up after 4 hours and we had to get them back this was off chennai somewhere we were not told where so air force was supposed to find out where it has crashed and we were supposed to go as a hospital ship get all the patients back and move them in and we actually did this we did the rescue we picked them up from the boats and got them bound this is how it happens on ships and uh, we have an emergency operation theater everything is actually simulated in actual it is not possible to do it today we can do it in simulation as a tabletop exercise i don't need to put people at risk but sometimes in military we have to do it but many such scenarios can be done one such scenario is disaster management which every hospital needs to do the first time you do it will be a disaster when you do a simulation that i'm saying because everybody doesn't know where his action uh, port is how they are supposed to function when suddenly you have a truckload of people coming mangled up but the first time you have done it the second time it will be much better uh now mulages we use things so uh, you can see it looks quite grotesque isn't it but uh, this is uh, uh, you know we have variables today and you can simulate an uh, injury so this is actually uh, nothing has happened to him it's thanks to my cooks and their ingenuity of my artists they use poster colors and everything to design this and suddenly my surgeon who was my cmo boss in cochin in kerala so he actually did, uh, uh, told the cooks just make these guys ill and uh, we had told them we'll there'll be an exercise but we never told them what time where we had warned them Uh, but we just sprung upon them what you'll do and then we observed and recorded what all they're going to do so that element of surprise was there the element of backup was there and you see how realistic it looks so it doesn't require a lot of money to do it it requires your innovation and jugad to actually get the mulages and nowadays you have uh, of course ca has got those uh, things you can actually operate you can do a appendectomy you can do a cholecystectomy live wearing a variable i have the videos but time constraints i can't do it but i will share it with sihs so some of the students can actually see how on a cut suit you can actually cut open a guy and uh, i mean the with a variable and actually do a surgery in virtual simulation so what are the things one first is there there are various outcomes you're looking at this is for the educators we're looking at a behavior change in simulation when you're doing team building you're doing at learning and of course satisfaction at the end of it uh this you know it's like a lesson plan all of your teachers so how do you design a simulation it requires a lot of uh, training in fact it's ratified it's uh, there so i'm a member of uh, society of simulation and healthcare so we have something called chsc certified simulation educator and these are the people uh, you can do an advanced one once you pass the basic one you do the advanced one now we had a uh, computer program and so most of the people who run the software and the back end management are called operation specialists so it is called chsc os and there's a chse os advanced so you do this this is a ratified one is not it come to india but soon it will most i see there is one in simbaos i think who is chse qualified i must have appearing for the exam i passed the basic one earlier but then i have to re-ratify it so i'm appearing that that's in us so it's it's ratified worldwide so soon like how we have acls bls atls for simulation you will be having chse and chse qualified as educators and it's like a lesson plan how do you plan your scenario so there's a whole training given how do you do this this is for the educators and what are your learning outcomes you have to design them well They, these are the part trust trainers you are a neurosurgeon you are a cardiac surgeon you got a cath lab you got anything you got to build your team you can practice everything any sort of neurosurgery can be done on this any sort of uh, and especially learning ultrasound the first one shows ultrasound mentors whether it's bronchoscopy av management any part of your curriculum you can do by simulation learn it and then go back and the best part of it is you can do it in your own time you can practice the skill this is for skill based learning when you are doing uh, using a high fidelity team based swimming that is basically for team building that you are seeing how a whole team will react in an emergency disaster or in the specialized suits like op operation theaters or neurosurgery suit or something so you can practice all of them in simulation and that is the advantage because in very short time you can get the skill that you desire so these are the skills that you actually thinking about you looking at the non technical skills cognitive interpersonal and then whatever decision making task management team working situation awareness i'll not bore you with all these slides because i can see some of them go to sleep so it's all there uh, the standard pyramid everybody knows does from the you know novice to expert so either he knows knows how teaching is the best way if i am teaching i learn i read about the topic because people are going to ask me questions then i want to do it and if i am teaching somebody else like when i am training my resident i have to be better than him because if he can't do it or he makes a complication i have to sort out that so therefore you know it's the learning process in which it happens and how do you do it oskis objective structured uh, clinical examinations and using standardized patients we make uh, someone like me can become a standardized patient in fact he or she can simulate any condition because i know the condition i am a professor i can you tell me i become an asthmatic i'll give you the exact history i will not talk to you if you don't ask me so if the student doesn't ask me the right questions i'll not tell you like in one of the simulation examination we had one of our matrons she had been given the clue that you will tell this but nobody asked her <laughs> 
So in the end, she said, nobody asked me. So you failed in the simulation because that particular thing was not brought out. Sometimes you push in clues as educators and how do we do this? And this is the cycle. So something, it's a feedback and debriefing tool. Like I told you this, how did it go? Address the comments, learning points, whatever. This is what happens. And uh, the other side is called the learning cycle. And you can actually Google it up uh, because the time constraints, I'll skip this slide. So uh, uh, can we, how do I play this? Is there an enter button here? No. Yeah. Uh, this is into AR, VR. So uh, what I showed you just now was something called immersive simulation using uh, you know augmented reality, virtual reality and we're using the Google HoloLens. The one that is shown here is Google HoloLens 2 but I worked with the Google HoloLens 3. So if Google HoloLens 2 is like a you know, 70 mm screen, the Google HoloLens 3 is like an IMAX screen. So you're actually into it and actually you can simulate everything in front of you. So I'll show you that again and how it happens. So therefore, you know, this immersive learning is something which uh, is very, very, uh, uh, you know, gives a realistic experience on everything. It is not just some part task strain or something. And costs are coming down with the, you know, VR, uh, the costs have come down. Uh, normal HPS costs 6 to 7 crores, one mannequin. Okay, but whereas when you're having AR and VR, the costs are drastically reduced. You have a screen-based laptop, you have the AR suits, you have Google HoloLens all over and the uh, one mannequin. The costs are one-fifth or one-tenth and costs are coming down because with the uh, Google HoloLens 3 coming into the market very much. So this will be available very shortly in all our, most of the Indian labs also. Uh, then uh, I also, I think I've already done this standardized patients. We have a 15 years data because the first HPS came about 15 years back in AFMC. The second one came in our research and referral hospital in uh, Delhi. Uh, so you can, the link is there, Medical Journal Armed Forces, we have 15 years data on simulation. It's a new toy for all the other corporate hospitals and everyone here, but for us we have practices for the last 15 years, we have the complete data for the last 15 years. And uh, one more thing, it's add on to it is audience response systems. When I'm doing a class, I got this in my paramedical school, I'm more worried about the student who's not good. The student who's good, everyone is good. But from the audience response systems, with using clickers, using this during simulation, I'm able to, or any sort of an educational exercise, I'm able to make out which student is not doing well. It is very important to use clickers or audience response systems. Second, uh, what are the basic courses that we do? This is any skill lab in the country. Now, most medical colleges and all have these skill labs. This is what we do. Paramedics, nursing students, this is a must know. There are certain 80 skills which everybody must know. And a lot of communication skills, breaking bad news, whether it is doing a glucometer, using a monitor, ambulance simulator, all infusion pumps, multi-para monitors. How do you train them fast? You train them through simulation, doing them actually, having those things there. And uh, this is a medical, uh, avoiding medical errors. When you practice, you avoid medical errors. And it's basically using the Swiss cheese model. Someday everything will go wrong. It's like the Murphy's law many times over. So what happens is when we're using checklists, when we're using protocols, we end up not making these mistakes. And that is where simulation has a big role. Safety in medical education. A lot of people harp on safety. The right limb, right size, right look alike, sound alike, all those things that we have in medical errors. Most of the aviation industry, I'm also in aviation medicine, uh, you know, I've done some primary and flown. So there we are taught something called attention diversion. We are taught errors, errors due to inattention. There are so many things on error. Errors itself is a whole topic. So therefore, you know, so this comes into that. And we, as educators, again, we use the Bloom's taxonomy. 
So in simulation, this makes a big change. If you have to be a simulation educator, you have to know Bloom's taxonomy when you're practicing, when you're making your simulation design. Otherwise, if any simulation center can be a multi-crore place, if you don't have the right type of simulation educators, you'll be a failure in your program. But if you have a good simulation educator and a good team building happening, and you have a good faculty which is there, all your students will be 100%. In AFMC, we, uh, when any student passes out, BLS, ACLS, ATLS is 100%. And certain must know is 100%. We don't allow him to pass out, they re-scrub before they come back because the must know skills are there because they are thrown all over everywhere and they have to perform. So if he's come there and we have sent him on a ship straight away out on a disaster, I'm sure he'll do well because he's done the must know. So that is what is the basic standards that you set. And we don't give US data anymore. We give AIMS, AFMC, name hands, our own symbiosis. We have a repository of data which is better than the West. I have inspected uh, research programs in the US and uh, my own AFMRC projects that students would have been thrown out. The US projects were much lesser. Unfortunately, they were a little more professional. They have more money and they are more educative. That is one. I think time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, last five minutes. So I'll, uh, this is something we did. I talked to you about double lumen tubes and I'll using an ambuscope. We can do this using simulation. So therefore, something very technically difficult can easily be learned in a very short time. This was one paper of mine which we actually did together. Uh, this is another thing, a 3D audio visual studio is a must along with the simulation lab. Because these days with the type of videos which are available, uh, you know, it is very difficult to imagine in medical terms ki what is going to happen. And every time that Cunningham's textbook of anatomy used to be crazy, we used to try to imagine in our mind what is anterior, posterior, this, that and peritoneum is, you know, reflecting here and there, sir is there, I think he <laughs> can share with me certain things. But now it has become very easy because all these videos are available as a repository in your college and the moment you do that and practice and run it for the students, they'll be more interested in learning what is there. Whether you're learning the eye, the ear, the everything. And it's beautiful in 4K. You must watch the videos. I go back to this 3D sim lab to watch the videos. Because it makes my anatomy easier. Because I'm an anesthesiologist. I need to know from my regional NSC a lot of things. I've learned a lot of things from this. And also screen-based simulation. This is one. We can actually run it. There are a lot of freeware. But you actually do the paid version. They're very good. Something like NSoft. You can actually practice anesthesia on, on the screen. Then, of course, this I've just shown you. Practicing ultrasound or part task trainers. Giving these things. So I'll just run across these. Uh, you mostly know them. The HPS, they have a rack and a lot of, you need an operation specialist along with the educator to run this. And uh, what is it? Yes, you have a physical world. Anything you're augmenting here is augmented reality. And you have a digital world. So here, when you move it, it is a virtual reality. What you saw in that video earlier. So in the middle, when you mix them both, you have something called mixed reality to make it like windows for dummies. For example, I am augmenting my own self with some magnification or with something that I'm augmenting reality. Whereas I already have a CT scan report which is tagged. Now that will become something like a virtual reality which I'm bringing in with my HoloLens and everything. I'm mixing them together. So I'm seeing a real patient's ultrasound. The actual, uh, uh, this is abnormal, abnormal. Now I'm mixing the normal with the abnormal and it is labeling. Okay, this is normal, this is not normal. That is using artificial intelligence, machine learning and reality. So when I'm actually operating, it is telling me where I am. So that is the beauty of this all. So that is where it is, mixed reality, artificial intelligence, also quantum comes into it for shortage of time, I think this for another day. And uh, wait, sorry, I think, can I go back? Yeah, this is how it looks. So what you do is it comes out in front of you and you do a mixed pinch zoom. That is what you do, this is uh, there. So this is how mixed reality simulation comes in and I'm sure Dr. Savant and Dr. Parag will have this shortly. So you'll be able to actually experience it. It is very difficult on your mobile to use your, uh, you know, remember when you first using a mobile, it was very difficult to use touch screens and all. So this is a little difficult initially when you do this pinch zoom, but in about uh, two, three hours, you're able to do it well. So I'll just show you how. So I think, can we just play this? I don't know whether someone's got the, uh, can you mute the volume please? Just mute the volume. Yeah, so what is happening here is you're seeing a 3D image. What you have right now is a 2D screen, but you have 3D simulation of this. On one side, you're seeing the 3D image when you're passing a scope. And on this side, you're having, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, you know, ultrasound sonar anatomy coming in. So you're learning both at the same time. One is the 3D anatomy and one is the sonar anatomy. And uh, uh, so you're seeing a beating heart and you're actually seeing it how it would in uh, virtual reality. And now it is possible to actually do it on the patient and have a background image of what is true. And you can mix them up with the label. If what is this? So the operator really knows what he is touching. We do an MRI with what is called uh, glions. And when you do that, uh, like neuro, you are doing it already using neuro navigator. I'm able to make out where I am. Otherwise, it is actually a, a skill which is learned by the surgeon that this is what it is. But whereas I'm an abnormal tissue, now I do it. Now this is one, we already have the ultrasound based one here in your lab. So this is what happens. You can actually move it out. 
remember grey's anatomy where you would move it out from uh, the skeletal the muscles the you know angio everything and now uh, i can not only uh, see what is happening in real time on a patient i can actually uh, so this is what happens and i can actually bring it closer to me i can zoom it that at the background is the google hololens i can also turn it around so the moment i use my fingers to do it i can turn it around to see which valve is bad or what is happening so this is the advantage of ar vr mixed reality virtual reality and coming into it so you see this so this is how it is i can just bring it back down and then i i concentrate so you can see this this is me pin zooming and this is me trying to turn it on correct so this is very soon going to be available and all of us we are going to become better students we're going to become uh, you know trying to do all this all over again and put it back so we can actually single out which like the orthopedic surgeon wants to do something he can actually just get the bones and do it yeah time up i guess so that's it this is me using the google hololens in florida i'm going again in florida they called me for another lecture and uh, so these are my references there are a lot of books available and of course the navy takes me everywhere that's the barren island volcano this is where i'm doing scuba diving in havelock and we're sailing on a ship this is andamans where i was last two years now i'm in mumbai anybody can visit my skills lab you're welcome i thank shis once again i hand over my co chair whatever i missed out i request madam will do it and then we'll take on any questions which are there thank you so much thank you for hearing thank you sir i request ms sebra pol to come on the dais and share her insights on the topic good morning to all of you on behalf of indian nursing council i would like to bring you greetings from the president vice president and the whole team from indian nursing council uh, after listening to sir i feel that i am coming with the starter after the main course actually It's because sir has already covered the chunk of simulation with a lot of things but i'll try to be very simple uh, very base going to the basics and i'll try to turn my starter into a dessert if possible i that's something i would just like to try okay so i would just go through this this is the outline of my presentation and what i would like to focus on is what the nursing aspects of simulation okay uh before going to the presentation let me just ask you one question is simulation a technology or a technique who will answer me please hope this will wake you up is simulation a technology or a technique yes it's both okay uh many times we tend to think that simulation is technology for simulation we need a uh, a high fidelity simulator only and we need so much investment to use simulation in teaching but from the indian nursing council point of view as a regulatory body we think about all the colleges of nursing in the country so we uh, there are it's it's a wide gap you have colleges that are just budding up with a few uh, like with a minimal budget then you have very good posh colleges so how do we balance both so we would like to strike a balance between both giving simulation as a methodology first or a technique first supported by technology so we go a little other way around though we know that it's both but our focus is mainly on simulation as a technique than a technology so sir has already shown you this where fatal accidents happen and behind every fatal accident you can see there are more than 600 non reportable uh, incidents also so uh, that's huge so uh, we can see that approximately 1 in 10 patients entering the hospital will suffer harm from these adverse effects that's the who and the john hopkins study tells that in the us there are more than 250000 deaths per year just because of medical errors and a harvard study by professor ja in india they say that 5.2 million medical errors are happening in india annually that's a huge number so we try to reduce them so why do we need simulation okay when the concept of simulation came in first so main there were many op oppositions coming up people were telling we have a good clinical facility we have so many patients why do we need a lab 
okay so when we have a good facility when we have a good clinical facility where patients are cooperative and all uh, where big institutions so they were opposing it but why do we actually need simulation it's because of the student patient ratio and the decreased length of stay in the hospital previously we used to have people staying for a long time but now we talk about ambulatory care and all so the length of stay is decreased limited clinical sites again there are so many colleges we need to produce so many nurses in a short span of time so that's a problem faculty shortage there's a lot of migration in nursing if you see a lot of people complete their course move away to other countries so faculty shortage patient safety initiatives it's not like uh, olden days where patients listen to all that you say but now it's the other way around we need to be more focused on the patient centered care medico legal issues are coming up and cultural change is also happening previously if you uh, when i was a student i can remember i did my undergraduate in madras medical college so we had humpty number of patients in the injection op they'll be lined up you can give any number of injections but now the scenario is not like that before each uh, giving each injection for each patient we have to explain to them get their consent but i don't remember doing that uh, 20 years back so that's a difference there's a lot of change in the field so why simulation now so training in simulation environment is an additional step in the learning process a step between classroom instruction and actual clinical instruction with real patients so it's between it's additional it's not a replacement many times we think uh, once simulation comes in clinical practice need not happen no it's a bridge that bridges the gap between theoretical learning and clinical practice so the uh, i'll also just like to highlight the challenges of clinical te uh, teaching students are exposed to live patients now we talk about infection and all with masks so how do we see the expression of patients so that's a problem then we are concerned about patient safety and the clinical uh, instructor's role is very dicey there she has to manage the students as well as see for the patient safety also when instructors are committed to protect the patients making mistake is an expected and inevitable part of the learning process but mistakes are a real risk to patient safety so we cannot take risks in a clinical situation so coming to what is simulation so i already told you we look at it as a technique first and then a technology as a uh, methodology first and then as a technology so it's artificial representation of com complex real world processes with sufficient fidelity uh which aim to facilitate learning through immersion reflection feedback and practice minus the risk that is inherent in a similar real life experience and we talk about experiential learning here sir has highlighted many things how experience immersion is important in simulation learning uh let me just highlight to you on the circle of learning so this is the circle of learning the framework where we can identify all these five aspects so there should be knowledge acquisition first so that should happen with all the theoretical aspects then there should be skill proficiency so we talk so was talking about uh, task trainers so skill should be proficient and decision making skill is very important so even we have the knowledge and we have the skill but we don't know when to apply it and what to apply that's a problem so this is a very important step in simulation uh, in the circle of learning and then comes simulation in teams so with the knowledge and the skill proficiency we take the right decision and work as teams and finally going for clinical experience so this is the whole circle of learning where simulation fits in yeah so here you can just see how simulation fits in the circle of learning so it's a teaching strategy it's also an evaluation tool it provides more experiential learning opportunity than instruction and there's use of learning technology 
There's emphasis on outcome-based education and implementation of evidence-based educational strategies. So simulation focuses on all these things. So this is a slide that shows how competency development and maintenance happens. So when a person comes in for a simulation training, usually they are unconsciously incompetent. They think they know everything. So that's, this is what we experience in our simulation lab. That's what we are, they think they know. So we just do a pre-simulation scenario, a pre-test kind of thing. Then they are aware of where they stand because they have been into clinical practice for a long time. They think they are proficient, but when we do it as per the protocol, something is missing. So awareness comes. So then they go in for learning. Uh, because after this, they become consciously incompetent. They know that something is missing. They go in for learning. And once they learn, they become consciously competent. And then they do practice. So once they do practice, they become unconsciously competent. That is the proficiency level. But pro and when they are unconsciously competent, there's a problem. Because if they are rusty, they lose interest. They again go into this step. Simulation fits everywhere here. So you can do a pretest to know that they are to stimulate their awareness. You can teach, you can practice, and you can maintain the competency also using simulation. Now, what is the paradigm shift? Previously, we, are talk we were talking about see one, do one, teach one. And we are, if we are able to teach one, that means we are proficient. But now we talk about see one, practice many and do one. Okay, so we cannot just do one. We have to practice many before we do one. Yeah. So what's the evidence? So this is a, a study by National Council for Board of Nursing in 2015, which says that 50% of the traditional clinical hours in the nursing curriculum can be replaced by simulation. Similar study is being conducted by the Indian Nursing Council. We are awaiting the results. Once the results are out, we'll know how much percent in the Indian context can be taken up by the uh, simulation instead of the traditional clinical hours. So this is another graph just showing about the proficiency. So if you uh, see, if we have just a single training, initially after the training, the proficiency is high, but as years pass by, it goes down. Then another training is needed to build it up, and then again it goes down. But when we have a simulation lab adjacent to the clinical area, or as in the college where it's free to be used, they can have different sets of trainings, so the proficiency can be maintained. So simulation is not only in pre-service education, Simulation is important in in-service education also, so that proficiency can be maintained. So what are the benefits? Just summarizing what Sir has already told. There's patient safety. There's be better preparation for new nurses. There's support. Uh, innovative teaching strategies can be used. Nowadays, uh, a major challenge for all faculty is how to make the students sit in the classroom because they are not interested in sitting in the classroom. They uh, Many times they are physically present, but they are not concentrating. So a lot of things occur nowadays. The Gen Z are quite different. So this is a very good teaching strategy to capture the attention of students so that they will really be interested and motivated to learn. And we can adhere to protocols using simulation. Okay, uh, because many times I know faculty will face this challenge. When you go to a different institution for examination or from uh, when you have a faculty external examiner from a different institution, they will tell you, this is not how it should be done. Why do you start from there to here? We go from here to there. Then there's a big controversy. But in simulation, we talk about protocols. And if the protocols are standardized, it's uniform. So every, everyone can use the same. We don't have that confusion and that uh, problem. Then overcome faculty and preceptor shortages and lack of clinical sites. So practically some places are facing this problem and that can be 
addressed here. And it provides opportunity to practice and acquire clinical skills, which cannot be done during the clinical training. CPR cannot be done during a clinical training. And any emergency management, like eclampsia management or obstetric shock, it cannot be done, PPH, cannot be done in an actual scenario, clinical setting. So this can be done in a simulated area. And it prepares students to provide safe and quality services. Benefits, the non-threatening environment is there. Then hands-on practice of the critical life-saving skill, uh, life skills without risk. Teaching of clinical skills is there and teamwork. So uh, very clearly stressed on teamwork because multidisciplinary, everyone should work on. So this is very important. And debriefing at the end of the simulation is the key for the whole process of simulation. So here you can see the advantages. Uh, these are pictures from uh, the National Reference Simulation Center, which is developed by INC. I'll be just telling you about that. So this we have already covered. So this is in a nutshell giving the structure of simulation. So you have pre-briefing and the scenario which gives experiential learning. So they, uh, the students are given a pre-brief, the scenario, then they run through the scenario, they actually work it out. So they get the experience here and then they come for debriefing here. And during debriefing, reflective learning takes place. So both experiential learning and reflective learning can be combinedly used in uh, simulation based learning. And what happens in reflective learning? There are reactions, immediate reactions that are analyzed. Then the analysis phase where so uh, actually explained that uh, they'll be talking about what went wrong, what went well, why it went wrong, why it went well, what can be done differently. So all these happens here. And then finally, there is summary of the whole simulation scenario. So with this, the simulation process is over. And if there are any uh, observations, the whole process can be repeated for better clarity. So repeated drills can be done using a simulation scenario. So coming to what's happening at the national level. So in the National Reference Simulation Center was established in 2018 and it is at SGT University Gurugram. So there we have high, medium and low fidelity simula simulators and the partners who established this are INC, Japaiko, Ladrill and SGT University together with a partnership. And this is a picture of the R simulation training. It looks a little different maybe. This is not a high fidelity simulator. It's a mama natale through which we teach normal delivery. The process of normal delivery where a person acts as or simulates as a mother and the whole process is carried out. So this is one of our pictures from our trainings. And then why did this come up? So it is to generate evidence and to integrate simulation into the nursing curriculum and the possibility of international collaboration with technology intervention. So that's the aim. Uh, this, we are doing it now. This has been achieved now. Uh, these are some glimpses from our simulation lab. So this is the task training area. This is the CPR room here again. So, yeah. So we would like to see a simulation like this, where a person, this is a delivery, normal delivery simulation scenario. So this is what we would like to see. So in the nursing curriculum, I told it's already achieved. So the nursing, BSc nursing curriculum has been recently revised and many universities have started implementing this year and many will be implementing next year. That is 22, 23, they'll be implementing. And simulation-based education, experiential learning, they are incorporated as teaching methodology in, into the curriculum. And it is mandatory now for each college of nursing to have a skills or a simulation lab. The mannequin list is developed by the Indian Nursing Council and it is shared. And again, it's not the high end what we are looking for, but the basics which are necessary for a simulation lab 
is present there. And specific hours for skills lab are also mentioned in the curriculum and 30% of the procedures can be signed off by simulation itself. So that's a liberal uh, liberty that's given to the teachers for use, uh, the usage of simulation lab. Previously it was, though they use in simulation, they have to do it in the clinicals to get their logbook signed off. Now it is 30%. And OSCE is a mandatory method of evaluation for clinical skills. So that's another thing that has been taken care of. Then the role of INC in promoting simulation-based education. So Indian Nursing Council has included this in the BSc Nursing curriculum. National Reference Simulation Center has been established and faculty are being oriented through the simulation-based education. So INC is conducting a six-day training for all faculty. So colleges are sponsoring them. One faculty from each institution is sponsored by the INC itself. It's a six-day training. So, uh, so far we have trained around 200 nurses. The target is 1,000 because it's wide. So that's happening. And there's another training for midwifery faculty where skill training in midwifery is given along with simulation-based education. That's five days. That again, INC sponsors one faculty. So the target is like one person from each institution for simulation-based education, one person from each institution for midwifery. So we'll have at least two, uh, two people from an institution who is trained with this methodology. So that's the target. Uh, yeah, And uh, Indian Nursing Council is also providing technical support to the ministry for the establishment of regional skills centers, simulation centers. So this is what INC is doing at the national level. So coming to summing up the whole thing. So simulation training helps to prepare uh, students to deal with unanticipated medical errors to develop teamwork and communication skills, to increase confidence, and to improve performance. So it prepares students for their future career and enhances maintenance of proficiency through repeated skill practice and drills. So when we see from the previous or traditional method of education, simulation is quite different because there's more of student-centered learning, it's more of competency-based learning, and more of experiential and reflective learning. And it has been proved that it is very important for the present healthcare simulation uh, education so that the people will be really trained to handle emergencies also. Okay, so I conclude telling simulation is the need of the hour in healthcare. And before I tell thank you, may I just uh, tell a short story to all of you. Okay, maybe you might have heard it. But uh, for the benefit of those who have not heard, let me just tell you this. Okay, it was a war warm morning. A small boy was walking on a beach. Okay, so he was just walking on the beach. He saw a lot of starfishes on the beach which were washed because of the evening tide. So playfully, he started picking them up and throwing them into the sea. So it was He was doing it as a a uh, fun activity. There was an old man who came there for his walk, morning walk. So he saw this boy and he was looking at him for some time. So uh, then he wanted to just provoke this boy. So he went near the small boy and asked, son, what are you doing? So he told, I'm just putting the starfishes back into the sea. And then suddenly something clicked his mind and told, you know, I'm saving them. So he told that. Then this man told, do you really think you can save them? See, thousands of starfishes are lying down uh, around on the beach. If the sun comes up, all of it would die. Do you really think of saving all of them? So this boy didn't expect that. So quietly he was just looking at the man. He didn't know what to say. He bent down, picked up one starfish and flung it right into the sea and said, Sir, I may not be able to save all the starfishes, but for this one, I have made a difference. So for this one, I have made a difference. All of us sitting here are somewhere related to healthcare. Okay, many times nowadays we talk more about technology, we talk more, more about health economics, 
And finally, we miss out on the human aspect of care, which is very important. Do we as healthcare professionals or a team of multidisciplinary professionals linked to healthcare, are we really caring for that person who comes in, not as a case, not as a patient, not as bed number, but as an individual who comes to us in need? So if we can touch the life of one person in, uh, in our career at least, then our, there's meaning for our life and we can make a difference. If all of us sitting here can uh, decide to see our patients as individuals and if we can work for it, surely all this technology will be a boon, will be a support for us as we provide quality care for our patients. So with that, I thank all the organizers for giving this opportunity. So we'll be taking up. You can see how uh, two is better than one, and keep building your health. And Adam is really good at nice desert. I think there's a little round of applause for the thing. And if you take on three questions, we can have to answer your questions. Thank you. I would like to have a little bit more clarity on simulated patients and uh, standardized patients. What is the difference between simulated and standardized? See, standardized patients are real humans who have got the knowledge and they are brief on what they are supposed what good way they are supposed to do. So that is the okay. thing. What happens is there's a you know, thing that is a match. There is a simulated patient. This, I mean, it's a uh, the HP, what the standard acronym is for the standardized patient. Now, standardized patients are used worldwide. In this case, what happens is he or she is playing the role of that uh, a particular patient. It may be an asthmatic, it may be somebody with cardiovascular disease somewhere. So, most of the history making and all these skills can be taught using a standardized patient. And since this person knows, he may be a, you know, maybe a doctor or a nurse who actually can simulate uh, or, uh, uh, you know, say the right thing and have a big knowledge of you can actually replicate what that case would be like. Most of the time, standardized patients are used for history taking and these skills and they are also taken for rare patients. You could actually have a knowledge and all and make it uh, look like that. So, uh, what happens is uh, learning a rare disease, for example. So uh, this person, like I know exactly what uh, some sort of thalassemia may minor or something what patient would give and what history they would give. So this way, it is uh, one to one experience. That is the advantage of the standardized patient. Now, when you say simulated patient, it uh, may not, uh, you know, you could have a knowledge that could be a simulated and you just told what to do. That's all. That could be a difference. I mean, anything I'm going to add, can do that. So explain, but. Uh, what we in our institution are uh, doing is we, uh, when a person is acting, maybe a student or maybe a, sometimes we use our office helpers also and we train them and make them sit there as a patient, we call them a standardized patient. Uh, we, when a person is wearing a simulator, like a mama Bhati, she is wearing it on herself. And then she performs the role of a uh, mother who is delivering. Then we call her a simulated patient. Uh, terminology is very with institutions, but this is how we are doing. So if it is a person around like for history taking her, we call her a standardized patient. But when she wears a simulator on her, or uh, not, not a simulator, it's a low quality. Yeah, so very good. Right. So when she is wearing it and she goes away, we can try to see from her also. Then we can deliver also. So that time we call the her as a simulated patient. One question for you. I have a lot of respect for the nursing profession, but when you put up that slide about maintenance of skill, proficiency, and the x-axis showed a duration of a few years, four years. I rub my eyes so with this I'm working in a community hospital in Mumbai, and to have any nurse in the hospital for over four years is like a miracle. Madam, can you help us in reducing the attrition rate in our healthcare with the nursing profession? That's our biggest challenge we have over here. So before you simulate to each of the next batch of them, I'm making a point to try and learn nurses' names from what I work at. But before I can even get their names, they're gone. So how is it that we can have our nurses stay with us for anything longer? 
This is a challenging question. Uh, but uh, that graph that I showed is not a people nursing, it applies to all health professions, I suppose. And how to retain nurses? That's a real question. Uh, I would think why nurses are moving. Actually, we have a session tomorrow which will be taken by our president. But just because of the question, I just give one or two reasons why nurses are moving from India. We have a lot of nurses who migrate to other countries. First thing, I think, status. Because many times, though we talk about equality, though we talk about nursing as an autonomous profession, we are all mostly considered as paramedicals, though it is not. Some will ask me why. You have to do some googling and you find out why. So, uh, that is one reason. And the next one is job satisfaction. We do something that are we really uh, getting the reward or at least a recognition for what we do. So that is the reason why the nurses are not still economic, that's there. But the person who is satisfied with the job will stay. Just an extension of what uh, she was asking. Uh, our usual uh, experience has been that uh, you know, the, with the lowering of entry barriers over uh, maybe the last 20 30 years, what we have seen is uh, you know, you also talked about uh, so many. Uh, uh, so thank you. The Harvard study reported where Korean. Now, one of the major factors probably is that uh, the caregivers who are there with the patient all the time, somewhere we see a lack of uh, skills and that is probably not just limited to what is uh, being in the curriculum, but their ability to grasp the uh, that much of a education. So, Probably a lowering of entry barriers was not such a good idea. The second aspect is uh, like the brain drain which we are uh, talking about. Now, uh, for doctors, the government has implemented a um, uh, they have banned uh, issuing of uh, no leave, that is, uh, no objection to return to India. That is no longer being uh, uh, issued, so none of the doctors can go permanently abroad. Now, is there something similar which can be done for uh, nurses going abroad? And why not? So, for your first part, I agree that the quality has reduced. I will not say no to it. Uh, as the uh, I mean, entry bar, uh, uh, it has been reduced, the quality has reduced. Uh, the problem was. Uh, talking from INC's point of view, uh, many times we have targets, like this many nurses should come up within this many time, so what do we do? So all those political factors also are there, but I think if all the faculty are trained, wherever they are, they will be able to uh, train the uh, students to be better nurses. So my uh, Answer to that is if the faculty is really motivated, if the faculty thinks she can do, she will be able to bring about change. So that's one thing. And the second question, I don't think I have the answer for it. Okay, and we should be asked uh, so I'll just add to that. It's actually your self motivation and the passion to one's career which rise in the, the entire healthcare profession. So, yeah, because uh, uh, this is what keeps us in our economic factor. So most of the people who join medical nursing and paramedical, they are they are, they are devoted to their business. Let me put it very straight. Regarding the second part, I think the introspection to see why you are seeing only the healthcare doctors, nurses who have all these uh, rules and regulations come back. Maybe you have the software professionals, engineers, and lawyers who want to have all these questions. Why don't we have the software engineers on Google to come back? Why don't we ask the lawyers to come back? Why don't we ask the you know MBA to come back? So I think there's an introspection we need to do here. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you all. It was a great honor to have you all attentive and tuned in. I now request Dr. Parag, Director of Symbiosis Center for Health and Skill, to felicitate Dr. Manish Honwad and Mrs. Abra Pearl. Thank you, Dr. Parag. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, as a health promoting university, we now have a short activity break. I welcome Mr. Krishna from Department of Sports, Recreation and Wellness to take over. I request everyone to take a part in this activity. Before we start with the activity, I will just tell you a few uh, uh, actions, movement that we are doing with this song. This song, uh, this song is basically an action song we are doing. Okay, before we start, just see there are four to five actions which we are doing. The first, uh, first uh, song actually is like this, like this. The second action is like this, like this. The third action is Knocking on the door, knocking on the door. Okay, the third action. The fourth action is polish your shoe and polish your shoe. This is the fourth action that we are going to do. Okay, I think we should please stand up. This is two minutes after the day. Maybe you please. That is Facebook page, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to tag us and use the hashtag SimHealth2022 in all caps. Thank you. <laughs> 